Actually, one more paragraph. I didn't realize it to finish off that section, and then we'll start another one. <clears throat> but when I closed last time, I had said something that you can study each function and not yet under, understand the underlying force. Individually, they each have their own questions and answers, but their answers are not the answer. And um, to assume, you know, we think because we're getting answers that this has got to be it. But we're only getting answers within the realm of that function or that, that administration or that teaching or whatever. <clears throat> and um, so I wrote, however, we can actually look directly at the core reality and not see it, though we see other things. I mean, literally be looking at it and not see the core reality because we're seeing other things. For example, we may see in the book of Revelation that Jesus on the throne is the center. Or is, it, or is that really the reality that God wants you to see? We may become distracted with elders, living creatures, rainbows, thrones, kingdom principles, while actually missing the point. And again, we may assume that Jesus on the throne is the center. But I say, I say no. It's the lamb on the throne on the inside of the bride of the lamb, the new Jerusalem, is the center to which all nations, regardless of how diverse, all lands, regardless of how diverse, every tongue, regardless of how diverse, gathers to the lamb on the throne inside New Jerusalem, inside the bride. There's the center. Everyone would say, oh, I see Jesus on the throne, but it's not Jesus on the throne. You know, that's not the real thing, you know, that, that it's trying to convey. <clears throat> so, but, but we do see the lamb on the throne within the throne within her within the bride, within the New Jerusalem. And it says all nations gather to that. Now all nations, that's, that's a very diverse group, but they're gathering to the core, the center. Uh, every tongue, very different. And, and like I said, I began one of my classes talking about the Tower of Babel and how all these different tongues and explanations and everything has gone forth. But now they're all, every tongue is coming back to this one center focus and is not based on their diversity, but based on the oneness that he might gather together in one all things. And that one is the life of Christ, not the teaching of Christ, the life of Christ. All right, so this, this next uh, section we're going to call Finding the Center or the Center Point. Very similar. We're just following along, only we're going to expand a little more. And to do that, uh, we need to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians 12. Um, a lot of people use this chapter to, to teach on spiritual gifts, and that's fine. It, they're in here. But that's not really the point of this chapter. Um, and I think the real point starts for sure in verse 4. Now, there are diversities of gifts but the same, and this is what you have to watch in these next verses. You're going to find differences of things, but you're also going to find something that is the same. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit, and there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God who worketh all in all, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit. And so let's stop right there, because most people start right there. <laughs> well, 
uh, for to one is given the word of knowledge. This is where they start. And immediately, the word of knowledge, uh, prophecy, every, everything, gifts, healing, it all becomes an entity in itself at this point. And it all doesn't have to have any sort of center. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is the center for the people who embrace that particular gift. That is the center. And, um, and they have missed what the prior verses were saying, but more importantly, they have missed it because either they're not looking for, you know, they're seeing the circumference and not realizing there's a center, or they're not looking for the thing that makes it all work, or they're not, they're, they're just grabbing hold of what's most enjoyable to them. And once you do that, once you do that, it's going to lead you down a road of feeding you your likes, your interests, until you become divided with someone else because they have something else. When the whole thing was sand, every ounce of this came, even though it's, there are differences at work in the body, there's one spirit. Even though there are diversities of operations of how to do it, there's one Lord. Even though there are diversities of, of administrations, the administration of the thing, there's one God. And it is declaring the core issue that all of these things, just like the tree that we grew, all of that fruit is just a manifestation, but we make it something in itself. And we need to find the root, and it will give new life to the manifestation and the operation and the administration. And all of it won't be by rote, or it won't be by business ethics. It will be by life. And even though the operation of this and the gift and, the, and the, the administration of this area and the function is different from this one, it all has the same selfless, self-giving life. And for that reason, it all works together. For we know all things work together. <clears throat> all right. So... In uh, Christianity, we have a tendency to major on minor issues. For example, for example, taking years to teach on the fruit of the Spirit when fruit is simply a manifestation of something else. I mean, I've seen this. I came to a church and was getting ready to talk a little bit about the life of all of these things. And on the board, they had all of this stuff, and they had the fruit of the Spirit listed, and the guy says, well, we've been on this about six months, and we're, right now we're talking about, you know, love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, faith. Well, we're, we're talking about gentleness. And so I, I just probed a little bit and found out gentleness is just how you, it's not the fruit of a God being, the spirit. It's not the fruit of a God being. It's how we do certain things with one another. Not teaching it as a manifestation of something else. Not following, following it to its source. <clears throat> and then the other example I gave, or building a whole ministry on spiritual warfare while never mentioning that darkness automatically flees when the light is turned on, you know. You know, you've heard my example, walk into a dark room and just start rebuking it. I rebuke you, darkness. In the name of Jesus, I shout to the north and the south. And I, you know, I remember all the stuff you're supposed to say. But, you know, you just, you, that's all the warfare, you know. Well, you know, the purpose of warfare is to defeat the enemy. And the way you defeat darkness is you just flip on the light. And that really isn't a direct action toward the darkness. It is a movement toward bringing something else. It is, a, it, is, it is a movement in your heart toward light and the belief that light automatically dispels darkness instead of having to yell at the darkness, you know. I mean, if, you know, if uh, it might be weird for us to discover uh, 
that in astrophysics, dark energy is nothing more than all the yelling we've been doing at it. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, like the body and members described in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7, there is, a, there is difference in function between heart and liver. But remember that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Now, we can understand that. I think some corporations really press that. The whole, so that you become dedicated to General Motors, or you remember years ago I wrote that song about you can, what was it, General Motors and Kmart, and they both, you know, Kmart shut down in this town, and General Motors has been <laughs> struggling. So, you know, just sh I mean, you know, I was using them as examples, thinking that that's stability, but they they're not any more stable than anything else, and now they're all flaking out on us, <clears throat> but. The, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts in the recognition that the parts are all filled with that which really is the whole. In other words, the whole isn't all the parts brought together. That's not true. The whole is Christ filling completely, wholly, every part, every, not just every part of the body, but every function that we do, that Christ is the spirit in which it's done. Not just that I have the life of Christ and therefore I do for God or others, but it is the, the life and spirit of it that he fills all things. And, and the scriptures in Ephesians declare that, that he came to fill up all things and when I hear all things, I mean astrophysics all the way down to the smallest particle, quantum physics, that he fills. Yeah, and, of course, I'm not really talking about physics and matter. I mean that he fill every part by his nature. And the reason why I say his nature, because every act comes down to motive. Why did you do it? Well, to be seen. <coughs> Wrong. You know, wouldn't it be nice if there's just a loud buzzer every time our motive was wrong? <laughs> well, most of us would be deaf. <laughs> I can't stand it anyway. But, oh, Lord, I just, I'm praying to you. But honestly, it, it gets down on the quantum level. <clears throat> and why? Why? And we'll get into that when it comes. But if all matter and everything was made out of particles, subatomic particles, that means that the largest things are made of the smallest things. Therefore, nothing, no area is too small that should be filled with Christ. No area. Is too small. And uh, bringing into captivity every thought? Anybody ever read that and really considered? He said, bringing into captivity every thought. Every thought? You know, most of us go, yes, hallelujah, bring into captivity every thought. And there's no real understanding of every thought. That And, and it doesn't mean every thought is, oh, Jesus is the most wonderful in the world. There's good, one good thought. Oh, Jesus, you know. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the motivational spirit behind it, the source behind it. Is it you, self? Is it for self? Or is it him, selflessness in self-giving? <clears throat> so, um, the parts have their own function, but all should work toward a greater picture than its own existence. its own function. Do you agree? But its own existence is not what it's about. You know, for example, if you were dying and your liver had really mastered the art of survival and a doctor put it, pulled it out uh, and you died and he pulled it out and he put it on a respirator and that liver continued to live 
and it's going, glory to God, I'm alive. <laughs> It's really sort of missed the big picture. It's supposed to be adding its function to the body so that life can go forth. And yet we get so myopic, we get so narrow down to our stuff that something else bumps up against us and we, hey, I'm busy here functioning for God. Well, it sounds like sounds like you've mastered it you know no you've mastered a function you remember in some of our early classes I said you have mastered your job description and you found comfort and control in that and therefore you think all is well and you've done nothing to the inside the real core issues of you which the core issues of you are never going to be changed except by the core issues of him I mean, just think of that. It, it, it's not even possible, you know. I mean, some little thing that he does in your life as a manifestation is not going to change your core issues. Only the cross and only by an impartation of resurrection life, which is Christ. <clears throat> All right, so in astrophysics, the properties that the moon exhibits are not just their own, but the result of an interplay between other bodies, gravity having their effect. You understand what I'm saying? The, the, the moon pulling around the, the, the earth and everything, it's not, you know, we say, well, it's actually causing the waves, but it's an interplay. It has been caught in the gravity of the earth, and there's an interplay of bodies that are functioning together so that you're seeing the, the, uh, the interplay of the two functioning in, in oneness that's causing the, the things that you're seeing, the invisible things that you're seeing. <clears throat> uh, so in quantum physics, two entangled particles, and that's what they call them, two entangled particles express something completely different and above what they could hope to manifest alone. In fact, they look at, they look at these two particles and they say, that one particle in and of itself could never become what it's become by being joined. This is actual fact. They, they look at that and they say, this is an amazing fact that one in itself is just a certain way and here's another one and it's just like it and it's a certain way and it, uh, it can only do certain things. But when they come together as a, 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 what, what they call entangled particles in union, when they become joined, it actually produces something above what either one of them were in themselves. Well, where do we get a scripture that sort of, kind of, sort of says that? Well, that's real simple. One shall put a thousand to flight, but two equals ten thousand. So if you have two that are not joined, that equals a thousand. So together, but not together, just quantifying what they've done, you only get two thousand. But when you put them together in a system or in a cord, it's ten thousand. Eight thousand more than they could have ever done. And this isn't math, folks, this is the Bible. Once you put a thousand to two, ten thousand, okay? <laughs> and it's just a reality, and I, and I think this reality goes beyond uh, godly things. I think it's true in ungodly areas. I think that there's power in being in accord. It just depends on your motive, how, you, how you're going to utilize that. Yes? I think the Tower of Babel. Yep, Tower of Babel. Amen. And that's what it says. He looked and saw that they were of one mind and one accord. He had to do something about it. <clears throat> All right. But here's the deal. He wants us of one accord, 
But the true oneness, not the accord of it, but the oneness of it has to be another nature, another life. The accordness of it is how well we flow with that nature towards one another. We're, we're in accord. But only because we're in one. The one is Christ. The accord is the result or the manifestation of that. We, we're no longer trying to kill each other. We're actually, you know, sweeter to one another than we were before. Well, good. But none of that is the goal. That's the fruit of the goal. The goal is Christ. And so, so our hearts, our hearts, so then our heart, our heart is the only true part of us that's going to find the core. So if our heart isn't hungry for the Lord, if our heart isn't after the Lord, we're going to miss it. We're not going to lay hold of it. There has to be something in us that's, that, that wants the Lord beyond wanting our own way. And one, one of the ways, because we're not, flesh is never going to come to that on its own. Okay? So there's a couple of factors. Ye must be born again. <laughs> You've got to have another life, another nature. Um, but even with that, we don't immediately conform to that life and nature. And so God many times has to bring to bear certain other circumstances, usually negative. For example, Paul said, you know, uh, I knew a man who came to re revelations and all this kind of stuff. And he said, but there was given unto him a thorn in the flesh um, because there were, because there's only so far we'll go with the Lord. Uh, and then it gets on a quantum level where it has to be the Lord after that point. It's like once you hit in a subatomic level, everything down here is going to be Christ. Everything up there, you can still have some of your motives mixed in. You can still operate and, you know, and you can, you can show your heart for the Lord. Okay? And that's okay. That's good. But I'm telling you, there comes a place where your heart is going to break down. It'll, it'll, it won't be for the Lord the way you always thought you were, I'm, I'm so for God. I'm, I have a heart for God. I have a heart like David. Yeah, right. You know? and, and that's okay. I think that that actually carries you for a while. <laughs> but there comes a time when you're not going to cross that line because you know what it means. You will not cross that line. So God has to bring certain things to bear, partially to show you how rotten you are, and secondly, to show you that the only life that can live it after a subatomic level, after a certain level, is Christ himself. It has to be Christ. You can, you can try to pursue Christ on those once you hit that level, but you can never reach him on that level. Um, it's a little bit like, and, and, and I hope this doesn't confuse you, but it's a little bit like trying to reach the speed of life. Anybody know anything about trying to reach the speed of light? The closer you get to reaching the speed of light, time actually slows down. Now, you may not understand all that, but it does. And so it starts, it starts slowing down so that you can't actually reach the speed of light. Well, who is light? Jesus is the light of the world. God is light. You know? And we can't reach. We can't catch up. And every time we do try to, there are laws that kick in that actually slows time down and you're actually going slower in time than we are. And I know you think that's science fiction. That is not science fiction. That is actual science. wonder why that is. I wonder, you know, here we go again. I wonder what the deal is with that. Man, I can't figure this stuff out. This here physics is just, it's a humdinger. I mean, you know, no, it's more than a humdinger. <laughs> it's, it is 
our understanding is the complete absence of Christ. We'll never figure it out. But you can see the example of it spiritually every time you try to catch up to his pace. And even when you think you're doing so good, he's got to bring you down to prove that only light can go the speed of light. Only Jesus can go the speed of Jesus. Right, right. Well, I've often thought, I mean, I, <laughs> I remember when I was in Bible school and I was reading that, and he says, and God said, let there be light, and the light, and there was light, and it was good, and, it divide, and he divided the light from the darkness. And I thought, that's really, I mean, he's bringing forth light with one purpose, to divide the light from the darkness. I mean, that's right out of the cage, you know, the first rattle out of the cage, that's going on, and I was, you know, I'd been several years in the Lord at that time, and I thought, you know, I don't think my darkness has been divided from his light, it still felt a real sort of a mixture, I couldn't tell what was him and what was me, you know, I always thought I was good when, you know, maybe it was Christ, or, you know, you know, you get all mixed up, and you can't fully see your own darkness anyway, you don't know, but I, so I'm kind of going, I don't think I've started yet, because <laughs> that's the beginning, you know what I mean? And all, everybody else is all the way down to Genesis or Acts or, you know, they're all, all the other Bible school students. Are, and I'm going, dang, I don't think I've really got out of the first couple of verses of Genesis 1. You know? <laughs> God help me. I'm falling behind. Well, you know, he's, and he's saying, well, don't worry about it, son. You'd never reach the speed of light anyway. Whether you're real slow or real fast, you're, <laughs> you're going to be proven that you're not it. He's it, and you need him. And if you'll just stop it, <laughs> you know, all that effort that the guy thinking he's, I'm going to do it this time. I'm almost to the speed of light. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, good example. All right, so I'm not even sure where I'm at now. Let's see. Um, oh, yeah, I was just, I'd been talking about entangled, these entangled particles expressing something completely different and above what they could hope to manifest alone. Entangled meaning join, forming a system that came about by their joining. And I don't know how to express this because uh, I'm talking uh, uh, quantum physics here, but I'm not. I'm talking in the Lord. <clears throat> These entangled particles actually form something that is, um, uh, that is just so far beyond themselves that the, the physicists are amazed. Well, this is the Lord. This is the ability of bringing us in union with him and becoming something. And in fact, and in fact, oh, I said, maybe I should just wait before I talk about this, but it's along the same lines. Let me just see how this, this all goes, and then I'll bring it up later. <clears throat> First Corinthians 12, 4 through 7 talks about differences, but the same God. In other words, when faced with differences, We're all going to be faced with differences. Well, I don't like the way they do that. Well, I don't, I don't like the way Randy combs his hair. Well, I don't like that little thing there. Or what, I don't know. You know, whatever. Whatever. There's going to be something that we don't like or whatever with somebody. <clears throat> In other words, when faced with differences, we must find out what is common to all or the central point. Because if you don't, if you don't in that circle, remember, if you don't, then there's division, even though it's of God. That was the thing that amazed me in 1 Corinthians 12 is all that, that old chapter is of God, and yet it's all full of divisions. And church people, 
Well, I thought the gifts were the answer. No, they're the manifestation of the answer. Have you found the answer? Keep going. It's in the next chapter. It is. 1 Corinthians 13, love suffereth long. Love is kind. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Well, God is love. You're not love, and your love will do all of those things. And think you're being loving when you're really being selfish. You know? So... Uh, what is the same underlying principle behind the differences? Gosh, if we could catch that, what is the, there are, there are, there is a common ground. There is an underlying principle that should motivate them all. And if you can find that, which is Christ, which is the nature of Christ, which, which is not a manifestation of anything. It is the thing that manifests. No longer grabbing hold of manifestations of him and making him everything. Somebody recently said to me, oh, is there anything better than seeing Jesus in the word? I said, yeah, seeing Jesus. Well, there's a difference. There's a, one is actually him. And when I say seeing, I don't mean him appearing right here. I mean the actual reality of Christ Light, life, all of that. <clears throat> it's a him. It's not a he does or about him. <clears throat> we believe it is the nature of Christ that unifies, which is 1 Corinthians 13, by the way. We believe this partially based on the fact that quantum physicists may figure out how the subatomic particles of our molecular structure work and all these mysteries and have no clue to the miracle of human consciousness. Well, what did I just say? I said a, phys a quantum physicist may fully understand every particle in this body and understand the material of that. But folks, is, what is consciousness? Is that made of particles? I don't think so. In the womb, matter is formed. Out of what? Where do the molecules come from? Okay, but that's still not, there's deeper, but I'm just, just consider that. I mean, a lot of matter starts forming up in there. What was it with amber? Nine pounds something? Nine seven. Jennifer is even more matter than that. Not that it matters, but. <laughs> All right, but beyond the physical, beyond the physical, beyond the, the molecular structure, beyond the atoms that form up into a new baby in there, <clears throat> um, where does the child, that child's individual personality come from? Because he's, anybody who's had children know that they have their own personality, and you go, where did that come from? Oh my God! Did you? Oh, okay. <clears throat> Although science has mathematically proven certain quantum theories, mathematics will never figure out our consciousness. And then I, I just put on a side note: religion, not science, may be the only way to come to the correct answer. And I, when I say religion, I don't mean religion. Religion, I mean the field that is after God, if you will. I don't know. I was, I was hard-pressed to think of a, of a title that would help us understand that, but the, the field of, of, of God and knowing God. Um, on a side note, religion, not science, may be the only way to come to the correct answer. Both have their place, and I believe that. Science has its place. I don't know why we always have to be against scientists. Even if they, if they make conclusions that couldn't be right, you know, there are conclusions they make that are right on a material world and on a level that you don't know anything about, you know? I don't know. 
I just think that it does, you're, you're not really doing much by putting other people down, whether they're scientists or anything. Else. No, and I don't, and, and, you know, I just don't think it's the right spirit. I mean, well, I know the right answer. The right answer is Jesus. Well, I just hope you get him someday, you know, with that attitude. You know what I mean? <laughs> Um, uh, both had their place. God could have created the universe by causing electrons to bang together. But the spiritual reality, the spiritual reality gets to the core of things because that's not the core of things. However, what if God actually made areas of reality that are beyond reason? What if, what if that be the case? Did y'all hear what I just said? What if God actually made areas that are beyond reason? Uh, beyond, I put beyond reason, and our minds cannot follow there. Could that be possible? First of all, let's just consider. Could that even be a possibility? Could it be possible that God could actually make realms of his omniscience on levels that we've never heard of that our minds could never follow, ever. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I know so, but yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. And, and that would frustrate people. No, no, I can know everything if I just keep going. Well, what if he actually shut off certain areas so that you'd never know everything? What if science could never know the answers? What if things were so far beyond the natural reasoning mind they could never even go there? Their minds would, it would like start breaking if they tried to, you know. Okay, you're saying something's happening in here. I better shut down, you know. Well, his ways are not our ways. And, 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 you know, I wrote it, I think I wrote it in a good way. I said, what if? What if God actually made areas of reality that are beyond reason and our minds cannot follow there? You know? Of course he did. And that's, that's great. But, there's, but there, is a, there is a slight cool thing to add to that. And that is... And what if he gave man another faculty by which to explore these areas called his spirit? That, you, that your mind, your reason could never go there. But he didn't just say, I'm just going to leave you a dummy. He said, I'm going to give you another faculty to be able to reach me on those levels and to know me. <clears throat> Reality can be looked at from different perspectives, spirit, soul, body. Looking at things from the body or the natural is defined as a, a secular worldview. Our minds, and, and I was meditating on this and, and I thought about it, so I jotted this down. Our minds may ask how, like a scientist asking how do these things, our minds may ask how, but our spirit would ask another question. Why? Why are we here? Why am I alive? Why did he make me? Why? It's not, it has nothing to do with how. And maybe it's actually not our mind that, that, that's asking the why. That's why I said our minds may ask why or, or how. Our minds may ask how. But our spirit would say, why? Why is this the case? Why? And start reaching into an area of your being that you never reached into, your spirit towards God. Or reaching into an area that you'd never reach into, what some people would call religion. But, you're, but it's the realm of the spirit. And it's the faculty of the spirit that is looking for um, not just how it all works together, but why it's there in the first place, and why did God do that? 
using our example of consciousness, we might say that science can, can explain the workings of the subatomic particles in the body, but life seems to be something outside the realm of that study. In other words, they can build a body, but not make it live. I saw on the news the other day, they said, uh, this is national news, well, we finally created life. And they were talking to these scientists, and they said, okay, yeah. Well, and it was synthetic life, and, and they said, well, this is the first time that the DNA uh, is completely synthetic. Okay. And so I'm listening, going, okay, you know, I mean, <laughs> and I'm listening, and then I heard it. You know, they just think, they just think everybody's an idiot, so nobody listens. They had to take a cell or something from something that was already alive and in, infuse it with synthetic DNA and from that. You following? It did, they didn't make life. They made synthetic DNA. You know, my God, I, I, don't want, I don't know if I want to see what that thing's going to be like. But nonetheless, you know, but they were touting that they had created life. I just thought, oh, God, this thing is going to rise up and kill them. <laughs> um, in other words, they can build a body but can't make it live. Well, most pastors can build a body, a church group, but do not how to know how to make it live. The focus has been on the administration and how it all works works think of it I mean I know everybody here had not been involved in that many churches but, but I've seen enough of it I mean it is an administrative some of the some of the biggest speakers pastors people I know that are actually on a national scheme are highly paid and highly sought after and well attended conferences based on strictly how to administer their church not they would never say this but in a business fashion that will be successful and smooth I don't know how you deal with Adam and make everything smooth no let's see I do a lot of businesses run pretty smooth because people will need that paycheck every Friday. Or they want to keep that position that they've got above other people because they like the feel. Or is anybody following me here? It, run, it runs way smoother when Adam is, you know, there's a carrot in front of Adam. You know, like that's how you make a jackass move. You got a cart, you've got him connected to a cart, you get a stick with a carrot and you hang it in front of him. He goes, oh, and he just keeps going, why the heck does this carrot keep moving? I'm going after it, you know, and he's plodding along and they just keep it slightly out in front. Well, that's it. That's it. We're the, we're the jackasses. We're content to do it because we think we're going to get something out of it. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, it does work smoother if you, you know, if you do certain things. But here's, here's my problem. Here's my problem. People always want to know what my problem is. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> my problem is I don't care if it runs smooth or not. I want Christ. I don't care if every, I don't care if the thing explodes in my own face. If, if as much as I can, I can get it moving toward it, us being conformed to the image of Christ, I'll put up with anything. I actually do things to shake up smooth running parts that are not smooth running because of Christ. I actually do stuff like that. I'm mischievous. What did that nun in Ireland call me? Rascal. I'm a rascal. I mean, when a nun calls you that. 80 some on year or whatever, how old she is. <clears throat> but but I, I have no desire, none, to have a smooth running ministry. 
I have every desire that Christ be formed in every part. So if Christ is formed in us, then there's still going to be problems because he's not completely formed in anyone. So if we're going to keep moving forward, he's got to keep some things shook up because then when we see problems with them or problems with ourselves, it puts us on our knees. It starts us again deeper seeking the Lord so that the place actually serves the purpose of the Holy Spirit to bring us to the image of Christ, not to make us a big, successful, happy, rich church that everybody loves and wants to come to. I mean, I don't even want to come here. I don't. On that level, on the level that every one of us know what I'm talking about. But on the level of Christ, I do because I think, I, here's why. Because I think my chances of getting the Lord are greater here than in some of those other places. And I really want the Lord. Now, I'm not putting them down. I'm just saying the, the mess actually... Once you cross that quantum un, uh, subatomic level, it's got to be Christ. And the mess shows you that over and over and over until you're convinced. And then you begin to pray. Then you begin to cry out on that level. Lord, it's got to be you, not me. I can't do it. I admit it. I'm the worst, but you're the best. And thank you, Lord. You're my life, and I believe in your life. And I'm not giving up on you. I get, I'm giving up on me. So I'm believing you to start coming forth with your attitude, with your love, with your way of, of approaching these things with your motivations and the Holy Spirit's going oh, I love this I love this church and we're going are you crazy <laughs> but he loves it because there, there's the hunger that keeps being stirred in us for more of Jesus it says more of Jesus less of me more of Jesus less of me hallelujah that's it I, I need to Oh, I thought I was getting close to finishing the thing here. I am far away. <clears throat> um, well, I said, in other words, they can build a body but not make it live. Well, most pastors can build a body, a church group, but do not know how to make it live. And, and just to, I don't want to belabor this because we've gone through we have gone through periods of this too but i have gone to churches folks that i mean there was you just didn't sense any life at all i mean they were going through the motions it was simply a religious thing and you're just going where is jesus in this mess and you just you you're looking you know, I mean, I have been sincere. I mean, instead of just judging, instead of having a bad attitude, I've gone going. And I mean, it's just like they have got their little thing down and they do that. And, you know, uh, somebody says, uh, <clears throat> this has been a, a common thing all along. Um, somebody said years ago, uh, Brother Randy, we like this church, but we think you should lead the worship every time. You remember that back on Bolivar? We think you should lead the worship all the time. I said, well, why is that? Well, you really know how to lead worship. I, I've had people, it's, last year we had somebody leave the church. It wasn't over that or whatever, but they said, we think you should lead worship more in this church because you are a really powerful worship leader. And you know, God really blesses your worship, and it's such a wonderful thing. And, and my answer is, we are the body of Christ, uh, da, da 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 And, of course, that was when Scott was pretty bad. And I said, that man, God told me he's going to be a good worship leader and bring the Lord. And I went with him and went with the Lord and went with Scott. And I believe he brings the Lord, and I believe he's a blessing to a whole lot of people, Okay. Well, that would never happen if you just keep trying to, you know, well, keep everybody happy and make the atmosphere good. Somebody said to me the other day, well, I wish you'd do announcements and stuff. It's just different when you do it. It's just, a, it's just almost like exciting or something. I'm going, look, I don't know about all that. I, I, I want Jesus in every part, okay? I want Jesus in every part. If, if somebody's going through the motions in this church, I don't necessarily believe the answer is is to 
quote unquote, kick them out and me take over. Does that make any sense to anybody? You know, even if I can bring life to it, I want life brought to the body till we all come. And, you know, there's no joy in going, okay, well, I'll do that too then. You know, I'll do this. And, you know, is everybody happy? Yeah, now we're happy. You know? Well, Jim's not as exciting as you. Well, you know, that's not the issue. If Jim or anybody else is not bringing the Lord, then let's pray for him because that's us. That's our body. Do you understand what I'm saying? And let's release the Lord. Let's release the Lord. Let's release life. Let's be involved in life. And, you know, that's honestly one of the things I love right now about the sound ministry is I believe the people involved with that really are doing what they're doing by life, and I really like it. I really like it. Whether anything gets recorded or not, I don't care. I just like the life. Of, yeah, I'm really, you know, well, it didn't record. Somebody said that the other Well, we didn't get that. It didn't record, you know. You know, I, as long as we're bubbling up with life and we're seeking the Lord, I'm just fine with it, you know. But that's true of any area. Just want Jesus. I just want Jesus. That's all I'm interested in. Um, the focus has been on administration and how it all works. <clears throat> and when you put the focus on Christ and life, you're walking on thin ice because you cannot, you can teach people administration. You can, you can command how things should be done. Do you know what I'm saying? You can write job descriptions. You can write steps. You can do all of this. You can, you can lay it all out there. Nothing on that job description is going to bring life. If the person doesn't already have life, the job description isn't going to do it. But the job description can make everything. You can, like I said, you can you can order success, but you cannot order life. And so what you do is you just keep preaching Christ and you just keep lifting up Jesus. And you know that the Holy Spirit is more faithful than you are. You know that in, in people's homes, the Holy Spirit is talking to them over issues that you would never even dream about. The Holy Spirit is speaking to them, and their hearts are being turned so that when it's all said and done, somebody, you know, I mean, you know, I'll never hear it in this life, but maybe maybe I'd hear it, and, you know, stand before the Lord, and he says, well, you know, the, the church that you pastored was full of, and the Father says, was full of my son, and I'm pleased. Well, I would have to go you know, I prayed and I preached and did everything else. You know, I watered and so, so and so planted and, you know, whatever. But the Holy Spirit gave the increase. It's only the work of the Spirit dealing with people outside of the church building. And so you, you know that. You know that the Holy Spirit is faithfully dealing with our hearts. You know that he's pulling on our heartstrings all the time. And I have that confidence. It's not all on my shoulders. The government should be on Randy's shoulders. Well, I'm dead then. I mean, I can't, I can't handle it. I can't handle it. But the government should be upon his shoulders. And to trust that. Well, okay, that's good. I'm talking about me. You do that in your families. You know, you do that. You do that in your own life. You do that with those that are working under you in ministries. You do that uh, with, with, with other denominations. But in all things that we have faith in the Lord and hope for all members of the body that God is well able, even if they're going the opposite direction right now, you don't give up. You hold on to them with all your heart. All right, let's pray. Father, we just ask you to continue to bring forth the increase of Christ. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who is so faithful. Thank you for giving us a place that we can learn Christ, that our hearts can be tenderized by your spirit ministering that to us we love you we follow you not man we're dedicated to you not just a place we thank you we thank you in jesus name amen all right love you guys you're dismissed